just ahead on Washington to Washington. We can't really hide from the mental health crisis anymore. It's here. The emotional well-being of the country's school children. Children who are depressed and anxious, who are being bullied, who are afraid, do not learn. How schools are responding. You do need dedicated professionals whose only job is to meet students where they are and say, how are you doing? And how are you developing? And what's, you know, what's on your mind? And how cutting edge technology. Mental health is personal. Could change the way students get help for stress and anxiety. Plus, one family turns their heartbreaking story into action to help others. It's such a horrible pain every day. We don't want to see anybody else go through it. From the capital of Washington State to the capital of the United States, this is Washington to Washington. The statistics can be overwhelming. Nationwide in 2020, nearly 17% of young people reported a major depressive episode. A 2021 survey of Washington State 12th graders revealed 45% felt depressed. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in the state of Washington for young people. Hello and welcome to Washington to Washington. I'm Jennifer Huntley in Washington State. In this episode, we explore the issue of mental health in young people since the pandemic and how schools, pediatricians, and the public and private sector are responding. But first, we begin with one family's story and how they are hoping to make a difference after a devastating loss. He was a truly happy kid, um, always smiled. Jenny and Steve Douglas could talk about their son, Drew, endlessly. We're happy to talk about him because we loved him that much. He was a very big part of the family. Very kind, lots of friends, um, liked sports, but wasn't really competitive. He just wanted to be part of a team, but just truly loving kid. The 14-year-old loved to golf, fish, and do yard work around his family's 21-acre property in Chehalis. He would mow the lawn two, three times a week and just put his headphones on and just just, just love life. I mean, he was, he was a really good, passionate kid. He was social and loved a good party. He'd always want to have a party. That's what he would call dinners. Can we have a party, Mom? Can we have a party? When the pandemic hit and the world shut down in March of 2020, like most families, things changed. As a manager of a power company, Steve worked throughout the shutdown, overseeing linemen who were considered essential. Jenny went back to work as a dental assistant when doctor's offices reopened. The Douglas's oldest son was gone for work. While their middle son was home, he drove so he could leave whenever he wanted. You know, he didn't have to stay home. Drew was often alone, navigating school online. He started getting some anxiety because um, he always loved to go every place. And because he was stayed home for so long and there was this fear, um, he didn't want to go anywhere. And he wasn't afraid of COVID. He just got used to staying home all the time that um, it got out of his comfort zone. His parents noticed his anxiety and started him in counseling. He went to the pediatrician and got on medication. But finding the right dose was a challenge, along with getting in to see a doctor due to the pandemic. We got to the point where he didn't like the meds. It wasn't working. And then to try and get off of it, they didn't want him to get off of the meds. And, but also due to COVID because of the um, scheduling, like the schedule was, they couldn't get him in until like December. He would tell us it wasn't working. He, we started seeing physical signs of anxiety. He would shake, I mean, physically shake. Um, just, he, he wouldn't go to sleep. He would stay up, he would struggle to go to sleep at night. Drew stayed on the medication while the family worked with doctors. Yeah, and the hardest thing for me is that every night, every time that he needed a refill, I'm the one that listens to the pharmacist of all the symptoms or, you know, that could happen, and suicide was one of them. I'm like, that's not my kid, you know, I mean, he's too happy. There's, there's no way. But the unimaginable did happen. Drew took his own life on September 19th, 2021. He was 14 and a half years old. 
How much do you think the pandemic played a role in his mental health? Was that 90 percent? I would say 90 percent. When we interviewed them on a hazy day outside their home with a view that stretched for miles where Drew loved watching the sunsets, it had only been a year since his death. Yeah, that was another sign. You hold it there for just a sec. Yep. So, so that's our, our logo that we came up with for um, our foundation. In that time and in their grief, Steve and Jenny formed the Drew North Foundation. That one they made especially for us. They hope to work with schools to establish programs like one they remember from their high school years called Natural Helpers. It's just a peer-to-peer a -peer group where kids can go talk and that can be your bridge to your adults, to your counselors, to your teachers, to your coaches, to your parents. They held a 5K fundraiser run in July of 2022 and plan to continue that tradition every year, hoping to raise funds and awareness regarding mental health and suicide and give kids skills for coping with challenges. We just loved him like our own. Angela Bennett and Lisa McKay are two board members of the nonprofit and friends of the family. They also work in the behavioral health field and know all too well the struggles of young people during the pandemic. Another reason why they didn't hesitate to join. You know, being a part of trying to help and showing these kids that we love them and that there is choices that we can make and we can help. So I really want to be a part of that. I'm a certified mental health first aid instructor, and I would like to see every coach have to have it. I would like to see every paraeducator have to have it, just like a CPR card. Mental health first aid is just CPR for mental health. The Douglases wish they had had a better idea of how serious Drew's struggles were, suggesting that therapists could give numbers to parents, much like the pain scale, without divulging private details discussed in therapy. But their main mission is to include as many people in the discussion as possible, something Drew would have wanted. It's such a horrible pain every day. Um, we don't want to see anybody else go through it. So I think that's what kind of keeps us strong is that um, uh, we just don't want to see anybody go through it. And it's hard. I mean, it's hard every day. If you or someone you know is in crisis or at risk of suicide, help is available. The number for the National Suicide and Crisis Hotline is 988. And for more information on the work of the Drew North Foundation, go to drewnorth.org. Now, there are a number of ways Washington State has responded to the mental health crisis. A new state law allows students in Washington to take time off from school for mental health reasons. It went into effect in June of 2022. Students are allowed as many excused absences from school as needed for their emotional health without a doctor's note or medical diagnosis. Schools have put in place social and emotional learning programs teaching students how to manage their self-talk and stay positive. More schools are screening for behavioral health issues as well. And perhaps most key to helping students is accessing care on site in school, especially for students who don't have primary care providers that can diagnose mental health issues. There are now about 50 school-based centers in Washington state with more to follow. In 2021, Governor Inslee signed a bill to increase the number of school-based health clinics. Many are partnerships with community health care organizations. Recently, we spoke with Washington State School Superintendent Chris Reichdahl. What we do in school isn't just about math and science and English and social studies. It's about how are you developing and how do we quiet that noise long enough for you to discover who you are. That's a lot on schools. It is, and getting more complicated every year. Here's some of our conversation regarding the role of schools in the social and emotional health of students. Mental health is one issue facing students of all ages. It isn't new. Students have struggled with social media and now the pandemic, gun violence, you know, contribute to all kinds of mental health concerns. Can you give us a sense of just how serious this is? I mean, are we at a tipping point? There's such historical context needed here. So here's what I would say. It's very serious. I think it's been serious for a long time, well before the pandemic, and I think it would surprise people to know that it's been with us and young people for decades. 
Here's why I say it's so important historically. If you can imagine 50 years ago, only 30 or 40 percent of or 30 or 40 percent of our students didn't get past the eighth grade. As they were in their most formative developmental time, those who really struggled just disappeared. They went into the labor market. We had an egg economy, a manufacturing economy. They they just left. We keep 85 to 90 percent of our students now with us through the age of 18. We have the highest graduation rates on record. So now the school system sees what I think has always been invisible. Um, and now they're doing it in a moment of pandemic. They're doing it in a moment when all of the crises of the world land right in front of a student almost instantaneously through social media. There's a barrage of negativity because it sells so well. It's so predominant. It's such an easy sort of thing to fall into. That's what's different about this generation is they can't escape it. And that's why we've got to increasingly think about what we do in school. What have you learned from counselors and medical professionals and students and you know, teachers over the past few years about this crisis? That there's a better science to it. So I think there's a hopefulness about, hey, this isn't something that we have to sort of break down um, in terms of the systems and say, what do we do? We know how to do this now. There's intervention teams, there's early screeners, there's the ability to actually put a science and a mental health uh, component to it. And then the partnerships that we've created in school districts in the community are everything. An analysis uh, this year by a think tank, Future Ed, showed that the majority of the schools in the survey were using federal relief money for academic recovery, staffing and facilities and operations, and only 7% of funding towards mental health. This is nationwide, though. Why do you think the trend is showing, at least right now, that schools are not investing as much in mental health from the federal angle? I think there's still a lack of sophistication about the importance of that as a precursor to high quality academics. We spent 20 years in this country on the false belief that you didn't really need to do as much of that if you just focused on math and science and English language arts and test kids and test kids and test kids. They'll get confident when they see their academics improve, and it's actually the opposite of that. If you really address their mental health needs and their social emotional needs, and their just natural developmental needs, if you take care of that, including nutrition, uh, then you see the academic gains. So what happened in a crisis? Everyone went to their old playbook of throw money at tutoring and get their math scores up, which is not a bad thing. It just is not the right sequence if you're thinking long-term sustainability of these young people. What role do you think uh, schools should play, though, in the mental health of students? Well, again, we are most likely to be um, observers and screeners of, of first observation, right? We, we, we have these young, amazing people for five to seven hours a day, so we get to see it more than any clinician is going to see it. But there's only so far we're going to go before we say, okay, now that we've identified this, let's work with families, let's work with um, caregivers. Um, and let's make sure we have a network in the community that can then take the handoff and do the deep dive of supporting that individual. So we play a big role throughout it. We just aren't going to be the primary deliverer of mental health supports. Do you think students are more willing, though, to talk to educators or to uh, close confident in school instead of their parents? I will say having my own teenagers, they are much more likely to talk to each other. Uh, but when they have a trusted adult in school, it can be a massive change, which is why we work so hard on the counselor idea. <laughs> Who's somebody who isn't hounding you for that math assignment or that chemistry lab, right? Our teachers are amazing and, they, and they've got a lot on their plate, but you do need dedicated professionals whose only job is to meet students where they are and say, how are you doing? And how are you developing? And what's, you know, what's on your mind? Um, so you gotta have those support systems in place. When Governor Jay Inslee declared a youth mental health crisis in Washington State in March of 2021, he noted pediatricians were seeing a significant increase in young people with mood disorders such as anxiety and depression, as well as self-harm. We learned pediatricians are often on the front lines of the crisis, and many are finding new ways to treat children who come in for routine visits but show signs of needing more help. Dr. Brad Stevens has been a pediatrician in Olympia since 2008. Over those 14 years, he's noticed a significant change in the mental health of his patients. We were seeing more anxiety, more depression, and we were feeling that pressure before the pandemic hit, and then the pandemic hit. Since 2020, the sheer number of kids struggling increased. What we're seeing locally is we're in a mental health crisis with our kids, and uh, and I think the reality of the situation is, is we don't have enough therapists to cover the need that we currently have. 
Dr. Stevens' practice in Olympia is responding in a number of ways. First, they started screening more kids for depression and suicide. Every child 12 and up gets screened at well child visits. They also expanded screening for other stressors in families that can lead to mental health issues. Whether it's like food insecurity, housing insecurity, you know, addiction issues, domestic violence, and we're going to sort of expand those screenings as well so we can provide help to those families. Finding who needs the most help is crucial, but getting them help isn't always easy. It can take months to be seen by a therapist. A few years ago, Dr. Stevens' pediatric office received a federal grant for a behavioral health integration program. I'm Tina Washington, and my title here is a behavioral health provider. That's where Tina Washington comes in. I target what their immediate needs are. Washington is a licensed mental health therapist who is energetic, positive, and caring. She started in the behavioral health program at Olympia Pediatrics in March of 2019, a full year before the pandemic. I had no idea that families were bringing their primary care providers <laughs> these behavioral mental health concerns. No idea. I was overwhelmed. As the so needs grew during the pandemic, Tina was able to provide therapy to patients who were screened in office and show signs of anxiety, depression, and other mental health problems. Our model here at the clinic is meant to be brief, um, which is four to 12 visits, usually half hour to 45 minute appointments, right? As Washington gets to know the child, she can refer them for more in-depth counseling based on the child's needs. But her ability to offer immediate support is key to the program. To see the relief as the program continued to grow, when docs were kind of like, oh, we have Tina, and they were so happy to offer that to the families. Dr. Stevens says as pediatricians see more children with emotional issues, it is vital to be able to provide help when they need it. It's been such a huge transformative thing for our practice, and I think this is really where healthcare is moving, is getting mental health counselors into doctors' offices. Because as doctors, we have our, you know, toolbox, which is, you know, quick counseling sessions and medication, and then there are therapists who have a, you know, that are a lot more skilled in working with kids. The practice recently hired both a social worker and a care navigator to help families and follow up with them regarding other needs, such as food and housing. One of the legislative priorities of the Washington State Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics is to expand training for therapists to conduct brief behavioral therapy in primary care settings statewide. When we come back. Not just are kids stressed, but also uh, systems are stressed. How are leaders in the other Washington responding to the national crisis with kids and mental health? Welcome back. According to Donors Choose, an online nonprofit that allows people to donate directly to public school classrooms, teacher donation requests to help children with their social emotional learning and mental health have nearly doubled since 2020. It's clear teachers are seeing a need and asking for help. So how is the federal government responding? And how soon might schools see funds to help pay for some of these needs? Kids are struggling. Dr. Kathy Minke knows how serious the issue of mental health is for students. She is the executive director of the National Association of School Psychologists, the world's largest organization for the profession, representing more than 25,000 school psychologists around the world. While 25,000 may seem like a lot, workforce shortages were an issue before the pandemic and have only gotten worse. Our standards recommend uh, one school psychologist for every 500 kids. And we know that in most areas of the country, we're not achieving that ratio. In fact, the average nationally is around 1 to 1,200. And in some places, it can be as challenging as 1 to 5,000. And clearly, when you have so few school psychologists trying to do the work of supporting so many kids, it, it becomes much more difficult to do that. We want to sort of apply broad brushes to this, but it's really individual students, individual children, families, teachers, and schools were all impacted differently. The School Psychologists Association worked with Congress and the Biden administration to help pass the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Over the next five years, $1 billion will go toward increasing access to mental health services in schools. Schools are applying for the first set of grants now, which total $280 million. We have two grant programs that are designed to both 
increase the pipeline of school psychologists and other mental health providers by improving access to training, um, expanding the training programs, expanding uh, supports for students as they go through those programs. These investments are down payments for the future. The U.S. Department of Education is overseeing the distribution of the funds. The science of learning and development says that when students feel a sense of belonging in their school, they're supported for their mental health and well-being, they're better able to learn. School psychologists help with early intervention in mental health, screening, and support for teachers in the classroom. Minky is hopeful the federal money will mean an increase in the number of school psychologists nationwide. We also know that this is not a quick fix that we need sustained investment in public education, we need sustained investment in um, community and school-based mental health supports in order for change to actually um, occur. The federal government may be focused on paying for the training and hiring of more counselors and therapists, but there are also innovative private companies in the technology sector that are looking to reach young people where they are online. Mental health is personal. That's why Neo enables students to learn from the privacy of their own phone or computer. When you think about therapy, chances are technology doesn't come to mind. But it could be the way all of us get help for our mental health in the future. A new app called Neo is a way to access care in schools and communities through an online portal. Neo's not just for students. School counselors can choose students to monitor from our healthcare provider platform. Counselors get to see the impact of our program by tracking students' engagement, as well as their stress and health symptoms over time. Launched during the height of the pandemic in 2021, Neolth allows students to learn directly from mental health experts on everything from managing stress to building healthy relationships. We provide stress and mental health support to teens via a mobile application. Dr. Catherine Grill is the company's CEO and co-founder. Growing up, I was surrounded by mental health from a very young age. I had friends and family members who had serious mental illness who were not able to get access to care due to financial reasons, due to stigma, and just really saw how devastating that could be. Grill went to school to study as a therapist and worked in psychiatric care. She was struck by the inequities in care. So she went back to school, this time to get a doctorate in neuroscience. So I was interested in how could we build and validate new health programs and how could we think of innovative ways to increase access to care and that ultimately led me out to California to Silicon Valley and looking at technology systems and how they could really support increased access to mental health services for young people. Dr. Grill and her husband started the company right before COVID. As they pitched investors, it wasn't always an easy sell. But Grill knew there was a need for a support system that could reach young people in a different way. The important thing to know is that it's self-guided, so it's not telemedicine. Um, it's really meant to educate young people about health, to reduce stigma, and teach them stress management techniques. After downloading the program on the App Store, students take a survey on their emotional well-being. They are then matched with specific resources for their unique health needs. So that might include a video series from doctors or even other students talking about their lived experiences with mental health, lots of relaxation practices or SEL kind of skills that they can build. Uh, they can even join live stream events throughout the month with doctors and other students to really connect and learn about mental health. The company worked with data scientists at Carnegie Mellon University to build a natural language processing system. The system can pick up on words used in the app that might signal the teen is in crisis. So in real time, we can refer them, whether it's back to the school counselor or back to something like a crisis text line, we can connect them to those free kind of 24-7 resources just to make sure that they have the help that they need. Grill hopes to make it easier for young people who might not feel comfortable reaching out to have a place to learn and get help. There are so many barriers to accessing mental health care. And imagine if in order to get that care, you had to climb all the way to the top of Mount Everest. And like, that's where the mental health resources were. It would just be very tricky to do. In just a year's time, the program has grown to more than 350 schools throughout the U.S. and 20 countries in Asia. Hi, my name is Dr. Aziz Isatius. Dr. Azizi Seishas is an associate professor at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine and the founding director of the Media and Innovation Lab. He is studying the use of the app by about 7,000 Florida school children. Over the course of a year, researchers will monitor kids who are using it to see if it increases their social-emotional learning skills. Will you be able to, over that year, sort of pinpoint the students who need it most? 
our hope is that this study will allow us to be able to identify as well as navigate kids to get the right mental health care. And Dr. Seisha says it could also um, help with future treatment by identifying which children are at risk through language they use on the app. Based on the artificial intelligence embedded in the NEOF program, we might be able to start identifying risk earlier based on patterns of answers. Seisha says if NEOTH is successful, it could revolutionize healthcare and expand the use of digital therapeutics as treatment options. I know there is a huge push to get many of these digital solutions to get reimbursement. So if you're on Medicaid or Medicare or if you're low income, then you don't have to pay out of pocket. Or neither and that would create more to, access in communities that are typically underserved. Do you think that the private sector is better equipped to handle new innovations, at least in mental health? I think there are the best cases of how we really innovate and do so at scale nationally is when the private and public sector come together to collaborate. I mean, government can be really great at things like funding, but also setting up safeguards and regulations to make sure, you know, things around data privacy, that those are happening in an appropriate way in the private sector. Dr. Grill is hopeful when she hears young people talk about their mental health, breaking the stigma and being willing to accept help, which makes listening to their needs even more critical. Just understanding again how they use technology, we can then change up the mental health system, add in different services and layer those with clinical supports. And that's really our way out of this crisis. The NEOTH app is funded through private investors and grants from universities. There's a free trial offered online and anyone 11 and older can sign up. Schools and youth organizations pay a price per student to access all the support. While kids are in crisis right now, the experts we spoke with all caution there are no overnight solutions. It will take years to build the infrastructure to support a system that can reach all children. From Washington State, Thank you for watching. We hope you'll join us next time on Washington to Washington.